بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد just before we begin I'd like to remind the brothers who are outside that the lesson is starting so if you could please come inside and attend the lesson after this the Sheikh mentioned that we begin with the guidance of Allah and the help of Allah the study of the book Manhaj Salikin which was authored by a Sheikh Al-Imam Abdurrahman ibn Nasr al-Sa'di rahimahullah who was from the teachers and the mashayikh of a Sheikh ibn Uthameen rahimahullah and why do we study fiqh? why do we study fiqh? because any act of ibadah is not accepted unless those two conditions are fulfilled the first of those two conditions is al-ikhlas, sincerity and this is why we study at-tawheed the second condition is al-mutaba'ah knowing and following the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we study fiqh so we can learn the manner or the method of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in fulfilling ibadah and then why specifically have we chosen this book Manhaj Salikin because firstly it is concise and summarized and because the ulama advise with this book and because the author, he mentions each ruling with its evidence. And also the correct methodologies to begin with the concise books before the more detailed book. So we want to take an overview of fiqh, an overview of the book. Firstly, the study of fiqh is divided into two main sections. Firstly, ibadat, which are the acts of worship. And then mu'amalat, which are transactions and interactions. And the books of fiqh, they always begin with the chapters pertaining to ibadat. Why? Because ibadat are more virtuous and more noble. And secondly, because we were created to worship Allah. So ibadat, because ibadat are more noble and we were created to worship Allah through these ibadat. And then after this, the mu'amalat. So what are the ibadat? They are the five pillars of Islam. The two shahada. And through the shahada, a person purifies his inner self. And this is the first aspect of tahara. Then after this, the book of salah. And along with salah is the book of fasting. The, fuk- the book of Janaz. funerals. And then after the book of funerals is the book of zakah. And then the book of fasting and the book of hajj. So who can repeat this for me? We said that fiqh, the books of fiqh are divided into two sections. Firstly, those chapters pertaining to ibadat, and secondly, mu'amalat, transactions and interactions. Firstly, is the chapter of purification. Then salah, then jana'is, funerals, Zakat. and then zakah, fasting and hajj. And these follow the pillars of Islam. And those fuqaha, they wrote these books for your benefit. Whatever you require in your life, this is for you. So what do you need? The first thing you need is to buy and sell. And so they give precedence to the book of transaction. After you have bought and sell and you have saved some money, what do you want? You want to marry. So the ulama, they mention the proposal or the engagement and the conditions of nikah and so on and so forth. After you have married, what do you want to do? You need to learn how to live and interact with the women and how to cultivate, cultivate children. You married and children were bestowed upon you. So after this, what do you need? Allah subhanahu wa said that verily a man begins to transgress after he sees himself as being self-sufficient. So after a person married and earned and saved money and ate and drank, now there are problems which are occurring. So divorce happens. Knowing the laq and knowing the waiting periods. And then the next chapter after divorce, what the fuqaha speak about? So after there is divorce, the family of your wife or your ex-wife, they come, the brother, the father, why did you divorce, what's the problem? Then, and then there are transgressions and crimes. So then after the chapter of crimes or, or transgressions, what do the fuqaha mention? Then you have to go to the court. And so the fuqaha, they mention the book of qada and the book or the chapter of qada contains witness statements and penal punishments. So after a person bought and sell sold and ate and drank, married and divorced and inherited and then there was crimes and then there was transgressions and then a person had to go to qada and then after this the penal punishments were uh, prescribed then what's next? And then after all of this the books of food and drink 
والصيد and hunting والألبسة and clothing all of this is mentioned so after this person has achieved all of this then that person he wants to finish and what does he finish with? so the laws of inheritance or the study of inheritance it, it is with the buying and the selling so the fuqaha they begin their books with purification so you purify your inner self before you purify your outer self either begin with tawheed the fuqaha even they begin with tawheed then after all of this they begin their books with the book of purification and this is a tawheed and they end with one of two chapters either the book of al-itq and this refers to emancipation and this is as if a person is freeing his own neck and emancipating his own neck from the fire or the book of al-iqrar it's as if a person is affirming his tawheed affirming his la ilaha illallah and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever's last statement was la ilaha illallah there's nothing between him and jannah except death so it's as if even in finishing the books of fiqh it finishes with a tawheed the first and most important step when it comes to fiqh is for you to have an overview or a picture of the issues of fiqh and this is what we have done we have just gone through the majority of the books of fiqh how they are structured in terms of chapters and books so who can repeat this for me naam subhanallah qultu sahl alan yalla bismillah naam قسمين نعم عبادات ومعاملات وما يلحق بها نعم طهارة صلاة جنائز زكاة صيام حج المعاملات بيوع ومواريث so buying and selling and then also inheritance نكاح طلاق عشرة نساء جنايات حدود قضاء أي نعم هاك معروف يعني خلاص تمام طيب هذه الأبواب اللي تمر معنا so these are the books or the chapters of fiqh which will pass by تمام. after the lesson if you download the copy of منهج السالكين it's available on the website go to the index of the book and go through the chapters and you will have an overview of the chapters which we will cover which book do we begin with the book of purification at tahara so tahara is two types the purification of your inner self and the purification of that which is apparent so you purify yourself from a shirk and also innovations and sinning and as for the physical purification then it is two types so first there is the tahara purification from al hadath and nashrah al hadath la la sanashrah so first of all there is tahara from al-hadath and al-hadath is major and minor a person purifies himself from major hadath through al-ghusl and a person purifies himself from minor hadath or minor impurity through wudu and then there is and then yeah. there is purifying oneself from a najasa physical impurities and so you have to purify or cleanse your clothing and your body and also the place in which you are praying from these physical impurities so purification is done using water and this is the base and there are two types of water that which is pure and that which is impure or a person can use sand or soil uh, for purification and this is secondary and this is through a tayammum so in the book of tahara which matters which will we study who knows now We will study the inner purification and this is purify, purifying yourself from shirk. So you have to purify your inner self from a shirk. And then you have to purify, your f physically you have to purify yourself. Or Naam. we can say physical purification and this is from hadith and, and najasa, physical impurities. And then spiritual purification and this is purification from shirk. So we said that there are two types of hadith which is a state of impurity major impurity this is purified through ghusl when is ghusl obligated upon a person when a non-muslim accepts islam when a person when a muslim dies any death except martyrdom 
any Muslim who dies except for the martyr has to be shrouded and before this washed. And also when a woman is into the state of purity after her menses or her periods, then she has to perform ghusl. If there is a discharge of semen from a person who is awake or he was sleeping and then of course intimate relations. How does a person perform ghusl? So there are two ways of performing ghusl. There is the most perfect manner and this is encouraged. And then there is the minimum way of performing ghusl and this is the easiest. The easiest manner of performing ghusl is that first of all you make an intention in your heart. You mention the name of Allah and then you ensure that water it touches every part of your body and, under, and your hair as well along with rinsing your mouth and your nose. And th with this level of ghusl, a person can then, perf and then can pray salah without needing to perform wudu. And then there is the second manner of performing ghusl. And this is the most perfect manner. Firstly, a person begins with washing his private parts, the front and the back. And he makes the intention in his heart. He mentions the name of Allah. He, wa he washes his hands. And then he rinses his mouth and his nose and he blows out the water from his nose. And then he washes his face along with his beard, separating the strands of hair in his beard. And then he washes his right arm. And then he washes his left arm. And then he washes his head. And he covers it, it with water and his ears. And then he washes the right hand side of his body. And then he washes the left hand side of his body. And then he washes his right foot and then his left foot. And then a person now can pray with, it, pray with this. As for the minor state of impurity, al hadath al asghar then this is purified through wudu. What are those matters which invalidate wudu? Firstly, any discharge from the private parts, the front or the back, from the men or the women, any type of discharge, it invalidates a person's wudu. Whether it's urine or whether it's feces, no, small stones, blood, passing of wind. The point is that any discharge from the front or back private parts invalidates wudu. Uh, and the second thing which invalidates a person's wudu is when a person loses consciousness. Whether this is through sleep or being intoxicated. Oh, uh, if a person loses sanity or sleeps or faints, or becomes unconscious or becomes intoxicated, anything which makes a person's senses or uh, loses consciousness, then this negates wudu. For example, the brother over here, if he was becoming tired or in slumber, you say to him, can you still sense and perceive Allah. around you? He's La saying okay. that I can still perceive and hear everything around me. Just a little bit of tiredness. This person, his wudu is valid. And then this person, he was in complete deep sleep, such that he saw that he had traveled to Manchester. This person, his wudu is batil, invalid. And then the third matter which invalidates a person's wudu is eating camel meat. The fourth matter which invalidates a person's wudu is apostasy, may Allah save us, because this invalidates every action. What are the conditions of wudu? So the conditions of wudu are firstly a person being upon Islam and a person having sanity and also mental maturity by which a person is able to differentiate between different matters. So when it comes to wudu, puberty is not a condition for the validity of wudu, rather it is mental maturity. And so many translators, they make a mistake when they translate tamyiz as being puberty. It is not puberty. And also from the conditions of wudu is niya and its place is in the heart and to verbalize that niya is an innovation. And the niya of wudu has to remain throughout all the wudu. It's nah. not correct for between the, in the process of wudu, a person leaves the intention. And also the seizing or the stoppage of that which invalidates wudu, meaning if a person is passing wind, he cannot make wudu. Rather, he has to wait until he has finished and then he begins to make wudu. And also, if that which necessitated or that which invalidated wudu requires istinja or istijmar. For example, if a person was in the toilet and he was urinating, before he makes wudu, he has to wash himself through istinja or istijmar. And also, from the conditions of wudu, is that the water has to be pure and the water has to have been obtained legally. So a person cannot make wudu with water which is impure and neither can a person steal water to make wudu. And also from the conditions of wudu, 
is removing anything which prevents water from touching the skin. For example, if a person is painting, or if there's a person and that person has dough on their hands, firstly, that has to be removed because that prevents water from reach reaching the skin. Once that has been removed, then he performs wudu. So the point is that anything which prevents water from reaching the skin, then that has to be removed. Like, for example, uh, nail varnish. If it prevents water from reaching the nails, then it has to be removed first. How does a person perform wudu? Meaning, what is the correct description of performing wudu? First of all, he has to have the intention in his heart and then he mentions the name of Allah. And then he washes his hands. And then with a single handful of water, a person rinses his mouth and his nose and then uh, dispels the water from his mouth and also from his nose. And he uh, rinses with the right hand and then he blows the water from his nose with his left hand. And this can be done once or twice or thrice. And also washing his face from the top of the forehead where hair normally grows to the chin. And from the tip of the ears to the tip of the ears and also that which is seen from the beard. And the washing of the face in this manner can be done once, twice or thrice. And then after this a person washes his whole arm. And what we mean by the whole arm is beginning from the fingertips and the hands, the back of the hands, all the way to and including the elbow without washing the upper arm. And with regards to the washing of the hands, in the first instance, that was mustahab, that was recommended. Here, washing the hands, it is a rukan, it is a fundamental pillar and obligation of wudu. And then after this, he wipes over his head and he wipes and he's not washed. So he takes wet hands, he begins from the top of the forehead and he wipes to, the, to, to his neck and then he returns the hand to where he began them from. And then with his index finger, he wipes the inner part of his ear and with his thumb he wipes the back of his ear. And then the last part of wudu is for the person to wash his feet and that is he begins with the right foot first to the ankle and then the left foot to the ankle without washing the shins. And then he says the dua which has been rated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is encouraged. The obligations of wudu are six. Firstly, washing the face along with rinsing the mouth and the nose and blowing the water out and washing the whole arm to the elbow to and including the elbow and then third wiping over the head along with the ears and fourth washing the feet to and including the ankles fifth to do this in the correct sequence so doing wudu in the correct sequence but without any delay between the various parts so for example if a person began wudu then after a short while a phone call came from Sheikh Ibrahim and he begins conversing with him no rather it has to be done without any unnecess unnecessary delay now we come to tayammum the description of tayammum first he has to have the intention in his heart then he verbalizes and mentions the name of Allah then after this he places his hands upon the earth meaning upon sand or soil or clay or stones or rocks as for that which has been manufactured, then no. Like for example, carpets or ceramic or walls or wood, no. And he places his hands upon the earth once without separating between his fingers like this. And then he wipes over his face and then the, upper, uh, the outer part of the right hand and then the left. When does a person perform tayammum? When, no, I don't remember. I don't when there is an absence of water or when there is water however a person is unable to utilize water for example if it was extremely cold and if he feared an illness due to using the water then he makes tayammum now wallahu a'lam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam jazakum allahu khayran